Hello and welcome to THR Presents. Joining me today are director Ron Howard and producer Brian Grazer. Welcome, gentlemen. How are you today? Great. Wow. Thank you. Nice Good. Talk. And congratulations on yet another stunning piece of filmmaking. I really just can't say enough about this movie. I'm so happy for you. And in the few months you've been promoting it, what has been the reaction that has most heartened you? Ron, we'll start with you. Well, it really starts with our first preview screening, which goes back about a year now. Uh, and w- what what really knocked me out was it, with a, a test screening outside of Los Angeles was how uh, open um, audiences were uh, to a, a movie that that, you know, that I don't know, the first 10, 12 minutes of the movie is is subtitled. Right. It, you know, it, it's so much an ensemble piece, including Thai culture in a most authentic way. And I on my way, I wondered if this was going to be some kind of liability in terms of our test numbers and things like that. And it was the opposite. Our, we test, mm. you know, it was the highest testing movie that I think we've ever had. Wow. And, and in the focus group, you know, people were excited about the authenticity. Mm-hmm. They, you know, these things that had meant a great deal to me that Brian and I had talked about a lot, which was just had to be, you know, preserve that sort of that integrity because this studio, this, this event was so recent. Uh, and 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 so vitally significant as it relates to Thailand and their role in it, their leadership, their culture, um, and and I was just thrilled that U.S. audiences were ready to see that as part of the entertainment value, part of part of what transports them. And I thought so that was exciting. Uh, you know, the reaction has continued to be very very positive and gratifying. Wonderful. And Brian, does that resonate with you? It does. It does resonate with me. I mean, look, first we were, you know, rather intimidated to to make, you know, there was a time we were intimidated to make the movie because there was a documentary that preceded it that was also quite excellent. And it turned out that both of the, both the documentary and this turned out to be very, the same story, certainly, but very different from one another. Um, and that, as you pointed out, by the way, um, it fills in all the emotional moments that couldn't really be captured in a documentary. Right. So it, it was, it's been very gratifying in that regard that, to have people discover the movie and say, oh, I heard there was a documentary, but I saw the movie or I saw the documentary and I saw the movie. And yet you get this independent reaction from people, uh, mm. always, always very unsolicited um, because why don't I never say, would you think of the movie? <laughs> <laughs> right, um, right. But unsolicited and just reactions that were so positive that people are like, I didn't realize it. story was so great. I didn't realize the story was so powerful. I didn't, wasn't sure how they survived. Um, how they survived was so, there was a level of uh, ingenuity, just the physics of that work. Uh, were, 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 were rather remarkable. So um, there, it just reaction was, was so positive. I love that. And before we dive, forgive the pun, more into the film, I do want to reflect a little bit on your 35 years working together, which I have to say is a record for any Hollywood relationship. <laughs> yeah, sure you probably is. have the most functional relationship of any duo in the business. And I would love to go back to the day you met each other for the first time. I want to know where this was, but I also want to know what your initial impressions were of each other and if those have stayed true after 35 years. So maybe, Brian, you can tell me your memory. Well, my memory, yeah, actually, my initial reactions definitely stay true. And I'll tell you the story. I used to ha- I have this uh, discipline of uh, at that time was to meet a new person. Every yes, I've read your book. Day. Yes, I know yeah. your practice. To mm-hmm. meet a new person every single day while I was... Um, you know, in the middle of my work day. And this, at the time, it was to meet people that were principally making a substantial difference in our media industry. And so I went from, you know, Jules Stein to Lou Wasserman to Robert Evans, who coincidentally was in the same building I was in at Paramount. And um, so I looked, I happen to now be a, a television producer um, successful on the lot of Paramount. And I see out my window, Ron Howard walking. And I thought, oh my God, that's my day. I have to get a <laughs> hold of Ron Howard. And so 
I thought to my, I just impulsively opened up my window and yelled out the window, Ron, Ron, Ron Howard, and started screaming um, in a pretty animated way. And in what year was this, Brian? Just, I'm trying to track what Ron was up to at this point. 79. Okay, wow. There's Ron, he knows the dates. And so, um, <laughs> that's very good. And so, I felt like the more I yelled, the faster he was walking in the other direction. And I think he just didn't really want to know what that was and, and want to <laughs> connect. And, um, you know, and so he all of a sudden zips behind a soundstage, which apparently was his office in, uh, in that area. And I thought, you know, I'm going to be even more ambitious. I'm going to call his office and speak to his assistant and say, I was the guy that was yelling out the window. And <laughs> I, too, am roughly your age. And we're both doing, you know, making a difference on the lot. Paramount. And I asked if he would have a Hollywood lunch with me. And, <laughs> and then Ron could take over from there. Um, actually, before the lunch, he came into my office. And I kind of knew prior to that lunch that this is the kind of per this is the person I would like to, you know, certainly support because he just really had this aura about him, not only of just complete, pure goodness, but that he would succeed at anything he tries to do. Even wow. though at that time he wasn't a mainstream Hollywood director, he'd only directed some movies for television. And of course was a star, actually, you know, an American icon and, uh, <laughs> from these two television series, Mayberry and of course, um, uh, uh, Happy Days. <laughs> Happy Day, sorry. And, <laughs> and, you know, I, well, I was getting ahead of myself, realizing I'm really rambling, but. Bottom line is, um, I just thought whatever he wants to do, he is going to, through his talent and will, achieve that. And so I would like to be part of, you know, I would like to, you know, enjoin myself with him and in the pursuit of my own aspiration and dream, which is to be a mainstream Hollywood producer. So I was able to pitch to him a couple of ideas. And uh, I really wanted him to do Splash, the mermaid movie, which would have been a G or PG rated film, or this movie called Night Shift that was R rated for sure. And he, of course, picked the R rated movie. Um, <laughs> it felt like I, I've done enough happy days and stuff. I'm going to do an R rated movie. He wanted That's to right. shift his brand a little bit at that point, right? Yeah, yeah he was. Yeah. Well, and um, then I somehow talked him into a lunch and we had that to, did that together. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Going back, though, um, a thing that Brian wouldn't remember because he, he probably wasn't conscious of it. But when I was making TV movies at NBC, uh, there was this executive. And first, in fact, one of the first really powerful uh, uh, female executives in the business, a real decision maker, uh, Deanne Barkley. Mm -hmm. And at one point, we were kind of crossing paths. Brian was leaving um, her office and we just kind of just said hi to each other you know but and uh, nodded and 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 I left and she said yeah you two guys should know each other because one day you're going to wind up running the business and uh -huh. and uh, uh and then I went on in and she was really one of the first establishment figures in Hollywood because my first my first movie was for Roger Corman who was pretty anti-establishment and yes and, he was yeah and, uh, and uh uh, but he'd given me that opportunity and Deanne had seen it and believed I could direct and believed I should direct TV movies for NBC. And she believed in actors transitioning yeah. and even somebody who'd grown up in sitcoms. And uh, she supported that as she had supported Brian on some projects as well. So she's a real unsung hero in our relationship in a lot of ways. And also the business that people don't talk enough about Deanne Barkley uh, and what a pioneer she was and how much she accomplished. But now jump a little bit later to this this lunch that we had. And even though I'd grown up in the business, I really had never had a Hollywood lunch where you're sitting down with, you know, somebody with ideas and talking about <laughs> projects together. And and I was I was really fascinated by Brian's intellect, his energy, but also in that very first lunch, I could see that he had a perspective on the business that I didn't have, even though I'd grown up in it. He understood ideas, 
in fact, we were talking about ideas that were his own. He'd created three or four story ideas, and we were talking about all of them. And and he would and he was producing, and he'd achieved that. Um, but he clearly had an insight into how to how to get a yes in <laughs> in in this business, how to gain that footing, and and he and. As we did start to talk about projects, the first one we went out with didn't sell, but the second one was Night Shift, and the one after that was Splash. And over a period of just a few years, what I saw was this remarkable uh, multifaceted um, capacity to also to succeed. Now, we're different temperaments, different personalities. Uh, In some ways, we see the world very differently. But when we align on ideas, we're very driven, and and Brian really knows how to get things done, and how to mm-hmm. how to and 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 what the essence of a, a project's value is. I don't just mean commercial value. I also mean thematic value, artistic value, and he also knows how to you know move the levers of of uh, of power. And um, that hasn't changed. That hasn't changed at all. Except we have further responsibilities of which Brian carries the heaviest load for, and that's Imagine Entertainment. Because, you know, not only are we sellers, also buyers, not, right. not only are we out there, you know, kind of hustling ideas that we care about, Brian is also supporting ideas of others who he believes in, who we mutually believe in, and, and helping them get their ideas done. And the company has grown in leaps and bounds, but that's a different skill set. So he's now added that in my mind to kind of his, uh, his, his arsenal of capabilities. Wow, that's a match made in heaven, it sounds. <laughs> that's why the partnership keeps working. I mean, we're friends, right, right, but, it, right. but we also get good work done. And oh, and, do. uh, and we support one another uh, in a way that's, um, you know, without ever anything being written down or in any kind of a contract, if one or the other of us believes in an idea, the other one will tell them the truth, you know, mm-hmm. about whether they like it or dislike it. But But regardless, the support is there. And I think in a lot of ways, that is really what our our um, business partnership um, and our friendship is 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 built upon. I love that. And of course, over the decades, just numerous, numerous, incredible films, each of which I find to be epic in scope in some way. And when I was thinking about your work and how it relates to 13 Lives, there's something of a technical aspect to a lot of these films. Obviously, Backdraft and Apollo 13 probably requiring the most science the most experts on set for safety and accuracy. How did the lessons you learned making those films apply to 13 Lives? And which lessons didn't apply? And what were you learning wholesale on the go? And maybe Brian, you can start with that. Well, I, I think, um, I mean, this is really a kind of a Ron question, actually. Um, I mean, I, I, I like the movies that you just mentioned, Apollo 13 and Backdraft, not only because of the science that you alluded to, but I like the thematics of them. They're they're about oddly they're including this story of thirteen lives. They're about individuals that are doing something that's selfless, something that's right. It's about they're about teams. You go, we go. I remember that you know thirty yeah. years later, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, it is is really about that. It's about usually it's about a brotherhood that it can involve women, of course, in this brotherhood. I'll call it a brotherhood. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's about having locking arms and and you go, we go, that kind of, that sort of mission. And and they're also sort of, a, they access often about uh, on survival stories, um, mm. survival stories that cause human beings to reach inside of themselves and find resources that they didn't imagine they had and uh, summon them to uh, to allow them and other, their team, their, group of people to survive as well, their team. And this is an so, example. It's a, I'm sorry, to, it's just an, such an, good. an immediate example of that having been achieved, you know? Mm-hmm. And this is why you do these true stories about these outlier circumstances, because, you know, you would never believe it if somebody wrote it as fiction. You know, Brian and I talked about some of the challenges and the, the sort of the cultural hurdles and, and in the specificity of that. And in many ways, I underestimated the kind of degree of difficulty of this movie from a directorial standpoint. You did, and okay. In what ways? Well, um, the, the 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 size of the cast, 
the, the, the onslaught of information, because part of the entertainment value and the power of this story and even the emotion of it actually came in very small um, uh, discoveries hmm. uh, about acts of volunteerism that weren't necessarily known in the headlines. Right. Uh, other characters beyond the divers and the kinds of commitments they made, the sort of leadership examples, not again by just the divers, but by Thai government, Thai hierarchy, but also just individuals making personal decisions, you know, right. and, and leading by example. And the density of that was exciting, but it also meant a huge cast, many of them speaking a language I don't speak. Uh, you know, behaving in ways that needed to ring absolutely true and reflect, you know, kind of everything we were learning about this story. Because the reason to do it and to and to sort of take those those risks um, was to, you know, as Brian was sort of saying earlier, to do the thing that a scripted version can do, which is sort of create that real direct sort of um, uh, pathway to to real uh, empathy from an audience and emotional understanding right. you know? well, almost like what we saw in apollo 13 which was seeing the families at home as they're struggling to reconcile this unknown they don't have answers they're looking for closure they want their loved ones to be safe and that's what we they didn't see on the news at the time similarly here we couldn't see the families all gathering and struggling and praying and i think that's what's so special about this it was also fascinating to work with those Thai actors and develop things like the spirituality which right, we don't right. know very much about, and the spirituality there in the north is actually quite different. It's a sort of a, it's a, it's a, it, it's a blend. Some of it going back is, you know, predates Buddhism, uh, wow. and, and and so to try to, to it was exciting to, um, you know, to try to get all of that right and to sort of to deputize everybody in addition to our our co our co producers who are Thai. One is a Thai writer. Uh, producer, the other is a Thai writer director, and you know, and I, I really was able to engage with them along with Siampu Muki Prom, our cinematographer, incredible uh, work, <laughs> world class cinematographer, and did a, you know, faced tremendous challenges, but he also was, you know, for us a a key, a key cultural consultant, and so it just was incredibly uh, rigorous to try to get it all on film in a fairly short period of time. The underwater work was you know, more complicated and even a little riskier than I expected it to be. Mm. Uh, and so all of that coming together and then working with James Wilcox to, to, to actually find, you know, that, that narrative that would, that would flow, that would take advantage of all of these, this information that we had to offer um, that again, was a sort of a, the, the, the reason to make the movie to celebrate this and, and, and just remind people and 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 hopefully this will endure if if the if the film is remembered and watched over the years that this this is what this looked like this is what this kind of brand of heroism looks right. like right. Uh, and and it's not always pretty and it's not always perfect and it's not always 100% noble but 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 it requires a kind of level of commitment and there's one other big difference between backdraft and apollo 13 like Brian was talking about or even you know even beautiful mind and rush those are all those are professionals applying everything they know and then yes, having to reach even deeper. Right. In this case, I found it so moving. As I began to do the research, I realized so many people moved the needle who did not have to be there. Right, so many volunteers from all over the world flew in. Right. With, with, I mean, not only no guarantee of success, pretty strong indication that they were going to fail, right. but that that the effort was still something that they were willing to um, commit to with all of the risks, whether they're physical or, you know, personal, emotional, career. Anyway, it was a, it, I, we just wanted to honor, you know, what was achieved. Oh, I think you've done that so well. And boy, the actors are just incredible. The English speaking actors, of course, Colin, Vigo, Joel, just wonderful. It's so wonderful to see someone like Colin, who, whom I love, but I've never seen him in a role like this. I just love what you've brought out of those guys. But I do have to ask, where did you find these incredible boys and young men to play these soccer players? The scenes where they're being fitted for their masks, these kids look genuinely traumatized. They look genuinely exhausted. They are starving I, I can't believe the performances. So tell me how you went about gathering this talent. Well, 
first of all, I I began to uh, realize. Well, I was I was told uh, by Billy and Raymond, our co-producers, that in the North there's a very strong dialect. It's so mm-hmm. strong that uh, the the people from Bangkok can't always understand everything that's being said. It's like a I very see. extreme Scottish brogue, for example. Okay, sure. Now I knew that I was going to delve into these characters and not all of it was going to be scripted. So mm. it, couldn't, it couldn't all be translated into this dialect. Um, so I realized I'm gonna have to cast kids from the North. Well, it's a, it's a disadvantaged area. There's not, there's not much show business going on up there. <laughs> sure, right. Um, and um, uh, some, but not, not, not a lot. And uh, so I knew I'd, I was gonna have to cast kids who had never acted before. So we then went into this, you know, really involved process with our Thai casting directors, but with also with Billy Rutavanichku. Billy was the one I was telling you about, who's the who's a young writer director, and he's also a teacher. And he he helped he went to the north. I mean, again with COVID, I wasn't able to come and go and travel. Um, and you know, his his task was to to record these kids, audition with them, um, but also you know, come back to me and say, who seems to have aptitude? Hmm. And we went through a really long process. Then when they, once we made our selections, I then, uh, as, as they, when they came to Australia uh, and they were all in quarantine, we were meeting, you know, remote, you know, via Zoom. Uh, and, but Billy was continuing to work with them and also just play kind of theater games or play video games with them and get them to think about their characters and talk about, and over that sort of two weeks of quarantine and two weeks of rehearsal where I could intermittently work with them, they were really learning their characters and they were learning to connect themselves to what they were going through to the point where the very first day of shooting, when Vigo Mortensen and Colin swam in diving in and popped up and we did the first scene i thought you know there's no reason to rehearse too much i, I don't want the kids to over rehearse we'll just start shooting right the take went all the way to the end these kids were great and 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 vigo and colin came over and said between molly hughes's sets which looks so real and the and mechanics of the diving and these kids we don't even have to act <laughs> <laughs> I think we were all relieved by how great they were, but it was, uh, you know, and we all that first day of shooting was, you know, was uh, intense, but we all breathed a real sigh of relief. And those kids just never, ever stopped giving everything of themselves. But a lot of it had to do with this prep work where they had connected themselves. Oh, well, they became a team, it sounds like, unto themselves. Yeah, I mean, just as the as the Thai kids did, the, co- the actor playing the coach, James, would 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 take them through a meditation every day before shooting and then every day when we wrapped. Wow, that is amazing. And Brian, did you find that these kids were at all familiar with your canon of work? Had they seen any of your movies? Well, I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. You'd have to ask Ron, actually, because he was more contact. <laughs> Brian, was co- Brian was COVID restricted and trying to make <laughs> movies and uh, managed to make movies and TV shows here. So <laughs> okay. he wasn't able to be over there with us. Um, but uh, uh, no, they didn't know. They didn't. I mean, somebody had told them that, you know, that, uh, you know, I'd made movies and so, but, they, <laughs> you know, there, but, uh, several of the kids were really good and, and could pursue it professionally if they wanted to. But when it was all over, I was very gratified because they'd had a really positive experience. You know, they, 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 they're skinny. They're not quite that skinny. We did some of that. <laughs> we didn't starve the boys. Um, and, and nor did we scare them. By the time they were doing the diving and where they were being carried, they had been thoroughly trained. So I mean, they learned to perform. They learned to act. They learned to put themselves in that situation. And I was very, uh, I was kind of proud of them, and uh, and 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 happy that I I felt like they'd have a they'd had a growing experience. Oh my gosh, the the most incredible camp experience of their lives, probably right. <laughs> Great. And Brian, do you think this is a movie you could have made even five or 10 years ago? And I ask that because I almost see the impact of, of your nonfiction storytelling that you've done recently, because mm. at times the movie feels like a docu-series hybrid sort of integrated with a scripted element, because some of the camera work feels extremely like a, a nonfiction piece. So Brian, tell me a little bit about what you, the, the two of you have learned about documentary storytelling that you applied here to make it feel real, even though it wasn't unscripted per se? Well, I think you learn from every experience that you've had. Um, So you're constantly 
I mean, I think it would have been hard to make had we not made Apollo 13, for example. Certainly. Because Apollo 13 provided us with the, the belief or the vision that there was an architectural narrative that we could make, that would cause, that would create, help enhance and create suspense. Um, and other things, you know, it had, had other advantages to it. But Apollo 13 also, because we, we blended science and cinema <laughs> in, in that we had um, zero gravity, we shot in zero gravity. So it's the vomit um, comet, I remember it well. <laughs> yeah. So and, and during the, yeah during that vomit comet, we were getting. Thank you. What do you? Your weightlessness for what? Twenty seven seconds, and you get 20, about eighteen or nineteen seconds of like film that, time. Yeah. Yes, that's you. Don't, you don't get the heads and the the, the tails. So I think that um, Ron it would have been very difficult for Ron to make the movie had he not made that particular movie, and even. The education he learned from Splash by doing an underwater flip. Yeah, I was going to ask part, them. An underwater film. And all the way back. Added, added to his, the, uh, the cumulative understanding of what's possible to do with water and weightlessness. And hmm. so you, you just, I think it gave Ron probably more confidence to uh, approach this film. It, I was grateful for all my previous experience. But also, uh, and you know, with Apollo 13, we also learned how audiences could be fascinated by those details mm. and uh, you know and find suspense in in the problem solving so that was yeah, a confidence true. builder and it was another reason why i just thought i i i do want to tackle this and brian encouraged me to tackle 13 lives because um i i i felt like i, I you know i had experiences behind me that gave me put me in a position to 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 try to realize the you know much of the potential of this story, but you ask about the 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 documentary work that that Brian mm -hmm. and I have been doing, and our Imagine group is just amazing, led by Justin Wilkes and Sarah Bernstein, and they're really inspiring. And absolutely, it influenced the look and the feel, even the way performances unfolded. Because I've done some documentaries now uh, where I've, people have been under tremendous duress. Right. And you know what? Right. It doesn't look that Hollywood. It looks a little different. It's not everything that I would have thought I would play as an actor or ex expect others to necessarily play. And it's a little surprising in that way. I applied some of that to these moments. And, well, it's uh, interesting, Ron. Um, when we talked about Rebuilding Paradise a couple of years ago, I was so moved when you were telling me about how you were talking to victims of the fires and how you didn't want to push too hard with the folks who were just experiencing this terrible trauma. And I was really moved by that, the emotional exchange that you said you had with these people. And it's, it reminds me so much of this, even though, of course, you were recreating this as a scripted story for 13 Lives. There's so much overlap. Uh, you know, I certainly felt thought about it a lot when it came to directing the scenes with the parents, which uh, much of that was, you know, developed and, and improvised. Again, we had, um, we had actors from the North who were experienced. Uh, hmm. who, are, who, you know, were not only helping us with the dialect, but also fleshing the characters out um, culturally, um, spiritually, uh, taking us through ceremonies uh, so that we would understand, uh, you know, some of the, the sort of the, the importance of the, the mountain and the, 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 the sort of uh, what it symbolized and, and maybe in a very material way in a lot of people's minds, you know, actually meant as in terms of the boys and the potential for their, their rescue. So it was a great journey and a great learning experience. I never had people complain less <laughs> despite the rain and the mud yeah. and the water and all of it. it because, why? Because they, they would look over at the real Rick Stanton or Jason Mallinson or the real Tanet Natsari or some, you know, and, and people who had been, had lived it. And, um, you know, what were they going to do? Beef because they were getting paid to be miserable for a few hours? <laughs> well, that's when it's good to leave Hollywood to make a movie, right? A lot fewer complaints. <laughs> it was, uh, I don't think we would have had much complaining anywhere. People were, felt, I think, uh, fortunate to be supported in making the movie. You know, first by uh, the MGM squad and then inherited by uh, Amazon. And the support has just been there from the first minute for the film and in a way that, uh, that we've all, all been grateful for. That's amazing. And in closing, Brian, I would love for you to reflect on how this project has changed you as a producer and changed the type of projects that you want to pursue moving forward with your buddy. 
Um, I think it just makes me want to do films like, do film, more films like this actually. Um, because they, they, they unify human beings um, and politics and, uh, are not part of it. Uh, there's no left and right. It's just about human beings saving and caring about one another. And, and of course the spiritual dimension I thought was very important. And Ron personified that with the sonic element that he, with the, with the mountain as well. And so, um, and so I, I, it just makes me want to do more things that have uh, this thematic to them. Mm. Well, I think we would all agree that we'd love to see more of these stories for me because clearly you're excellent at telling them. So congratulations to both of you. This is just a stunning film. I hope people continue to discover it and appreciate this hard work. Thank you. We really appreciate it.